and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome uh, our next speaker. We've talked over the last three days about a lot of technologies and handheld technologies and we've talked about the benefits of being able to communicate with one another through those technologies and what often gets forgotten and left behind in all of that are, are the, the invisible technologies that underpin this that actually make that handheld mobile connectivity uh, possible. And, and we're very fortunate to have with us this morning uh, someone who's, who's an expert in that field and who's going to talk to us about those technologies and, and perhaps address some of the issues that have, that have emerged publicly um, recently uh, about those technologies. So I'd like you to welcome Michael Refficioli. much and, uh, and I, I, I must say personally I very much appreciated and enjoyed that previous presentation. I thought that was, uh, it's nice to know that uh, education is really thinking or looking forward to these uh, beneficial applications to learning. I, I'm going to change the tone I guess of uh, the discussion and look at potential negatives. People have concerns about, whoops, I haven't got my So, uh, as Steve said, we, we, we all use technologies, uh, but there are concerns about uh, health issues. Are there any consequences from exposure to the electromagnetic fields that are produced? And uh, everyone in the world, all countries are using these. And if I can take something that uh, Graham had mentioned before, Aldous Huxley said that the vast majority of human beings dislike or even dread or notions with which they are not familiar. Hence it comes about that their appearance, uh, uh, at their first appearance, innovators have always been derided as fools and madmen. So what can we say about the inventors of wireless RF technologies in our brave new world? We certainly are in the midst of a, a massive technological revolution and it's, uh, it's really quite exciting. You know, uh, well over a hundred years ago when landline telephones were first introduced into uh, New York City, people were fearful about the fields from the wires. So when technologies are introduced in a, in a way that people don't understand, then there is fear and concern. Are we doing something that uh, uh, could be potentially harmful to health? And we, we have the examples of asbestos, of uh, ionizing radiations where the limits uh, of ionizing radiations have been reduced a number of times as we get more information and people think of these past occurrences that have occurred and are we doing similar things with EMF technologies. So uh, obviously there's, there's base stations are needed for mobile communications and People worry about the long-term exposures. They don't seem to be worried so much about the short-term, acute, very high exposures by comparison to base stations from mobile phones. They're worried about the 24-hour exposures that come from base stations or Wi-Fi. Uh, I should add that uh, I, I worked for WHO in Geneva for uh, 11 years, and this is the WHO, one of the WHO buildings. And three mobile phone base stations sitting on top of the uh, buildings in the WHO cafeteria. As with uh, many schools, airports, business centers, and residential buildings, uh, there's Wi-Fi so that you can go to the cafeteria and continue your work. The main focus that WHO had is developing countries, and I was very happy to see um, the, the projects that are going on in developing countries. But we need to ensure that new technologies are introduced safely so they can use, be used everywhere by children for learning and communication. It's no use trying to hold back the tide of the, the technological revolution. People that are going to stay behind and say, no, no, I don't want to take, use the technology because I think it may be unsafe, will be left out of the workforce. And so we're really committed to children being very adept uh, using new technologies.
Now, let me say something about health risks. The assessment of health risks needs all scientific information to be used. You can't just select studies that suit your own view. And I, I quote, uh, not quote, but uh, people who may have heard about this bioinitiative report that's on the website now, where a number of groups have compiled a fairly large document that I've just recently reviewed, um, have been selecting studies to say, look, there's a big problem because this study says that. What WHO and all national and international authorities say is that you have to look at all of the evidence. You can't just take or cherry pick evidence. You have to see the, uh, use a weight of evidence approach, which is used by WHO for over 60 years, and it's well, well known. I started the uh, International EMF Project at WHO back in 1995, primarily to evaluate the evidence, to report on current status of knowledge, to identify gaps in knowledge where more research is needed to uh, allow us to make better health risk assessments, then to promote and facilitate research, conduct the health risk assessments and risk estimations and develop policy options for national authorities to help them with the very difficult issue and sensitive issue in many countries of exposure to EMF and to provide information to them. And one of the major objectives has always been to update effectively this scientific database of information which these environmental health criteria monographs that WHO produce are the highest level scientific assessments of any um, chemical, biological, or physical agent. And um, while I retired from WHO uh, last year, uh, we've almost finished. There's just one more to go, and it's on static field, uh, on uh, radio frequency fields that we need to update now. And we have six international organizations and over 60 countries are involved in the EMF project. So it, it's not a small project. Uh, let me just talk about base stations. Uh, base stations, this is one just outside of Rome Airport. Um, the exposures are low that people uh, are exposed to. They're lower than radio or television. Uh, but it depends on, of course, where you make your measurements. If you're standing right next to the base station, then it will be uh, somewhat higher than radio or television. And it's difficult to, si to distinguish between the radio frequency fields from a base station from other sources in our environment. I mean, we are living in a sea of radio frequency signals. Some are much stronger than others. And that's just how it is. Few studies on health effects from base stations alone have been conducted because of this difficulty of needing a, a, a spectrum analyzer to distinguish which, uh, what, are, what are the uh, exposures from the base station as compared to radio or television or uh, other personal communication devices. And I don't know how well, yeah, you can see this reasonably well. This just shows uh, some of the exposures, which really uh, some of the, the regular uh, technologies, and, and you can see that they're very much below the ICNIRP standards, and that that's really the question of this, or the, the output of this slide. I should add that WHO has procedures where staff members are not members of any committees. They just facilitate the meeting of experts who conduct the reviews, and make conclusions and recommendations. And then WHO can um, use this information. All WHO publications are reviewed by experts worldwide, by the 60 country, over 60 countries of the International Advisory Committee of the EMF Project, and by the U WHO Director General's Office. And the WHO fact sheets are also approved by the Director General of WHO and become WHO policy. So when you look at a fact sheet from WHO, it has the imprimatur of WHO. And as most other projects, the EMF project has received 
funding from member states and industry with using similar firewalls as used by the, uh, uh, the UK's um, mobile telephone and health research project which has just released most of its results, the EU FIF framework and the Interphone study which is uh, being conducted by another WHO agency called the International Agency for Research on Cancer and they should be coming out with the results in the near future. It's very important because the British press is one of the most aggressive in the world and when the press comes out and say we've found a biological effect uh, in some scientific study <coughs> you can't just say that this biological effect will necessarily translate into a health effect. It won't. In most cases it doesn't. It can be any measurable physiological response to an EMF exposure and it must be evaluated to determine whether it will have a health consequence. Obviously an adverse health effect is a biological effect which is outside the body's normal range of compensation and is detrimental to health or well-being. That's the WHO definition of health in its charter. If I just look at the WHO fact sheet, which is available on the web, produced May last year, we see that RF exposures from base stations uh, emit extremely low levels and maybe up to 2%. The only time that you can approach the limits of the international guidelines from a base station is if you come within about half a meter and then you start approaching the, the limits of the uh, uh, recommended by uh, ICNA. The only established health effects is an increase in body temperature and this forms the basis of the ICNA guidelines which the UK is a, uh, a, a, um, accepts as does the European Commission and there's no significant temperature rise occurs from wireless signals. I should add that there are non-thermal effects. People wonder, you know, we know that as with microwave ovens you can produce heating with RF and, and cook and that you obviously have to have a threshold level below which you're not going to have effect and above which you're, you're going to start doing some damage. But are there levels below the thermal thresholds that could cause some damage? And WHO has been promoting research in that area for the last 11 years and there has not been one effect which has been established or reproduced by an independent laboratory which is a criterion that WHO requires. It just doesn't say yes that study says this but we're not going to believe it until it's been replicated by an independent laboratory because there's a lot of research that has been done which is uh, not as high quality as we would like. Now, the body absorbs actually five times more of the radio frequency signals from radio and television than it does from mobile phones. And this is because the radio and televisions use lower frequency and because there's a frequency dependence of absorption of the radio frequency field, um, more will be absorbed at the radio and television frequencies than the higher frequencies that are used by uh, mobile phones or Wi-Fi. We've used radio and television uh, signals for over 50 years without any known health consequences and no one is complaining about the radio or television but they're complaining about base stations and Wi-Fi that generally emit much lower signals. It's to a scientist, it, it seems illogical to be worried about something like this when there's other signals in the environment. And the frequency differences are such that it will not make any real difference to biological effects. Um, people worry about uh, modulation effects. As new technologies come on, they will use different modulations of the signals and people say, well, you know, certain modulations may have a health impact where other modulations won't. I was involved in a couple of theoretical studies to look at 
what happens when radio frequency signals are absorbed by the body? What happens in the cells or tissues with different modulations, with different intensities, with different frequencies? And the bottom line was that nothing happens with the low signals that are occurring in our environment from uh, radio, television, mobile communication, wireless communications technologies. The signals are too weak to have a modulation effect. As you get up higher intensities, yes, you can get a modulation effect, but you have to have much higher intensities. Health effects and cancer is, is probably the major concern that people have. Now, none of the researchers provide any convincing evidence that you can increase the risk of cancer even at levels much higher than those emitted by base stations or um, wireless technologies. People worry about cancer clusters, but cancers are not evenly distributed throughout a population. There will be groups um, where you have an average, there will be groups that will be higher, and others, other areas, much lower levels of cancer. And wherever you see these cancer clusters, you're going to see a base station because base stations are everywhere. They're, they're almost evenly distributed throughout the environment. So whatever happens in a, in a cluster, there will be a base station near it, but it doesn't mean that the cluster is going to cause a cancer. And you have to look back at the research to see whether um, these fields are really capable of producing the effects on the DNA that could result in cancer. And all of the information that we have at the moment says that it doesn't. General health effects, there's been a lot of animal and uh, human studies on brainwave patterns, cognition, behavior after RF exposure, RF exposures, and they haven't established any effect. And when I say established, you have to have independent replications of studies before this can be believed. And I don't know of any scientist that goes out to do a study hoping to get a negative effect, but they all want to get a Nobel Prize. They want to be able to get an effect and then find out what's happening. So scientists uh, live to get a good publication that's going to be widely quoted. So they don't go and look for negative effects. They want to find one. All we ask now is a scientist to find something below the levels of the international standards that's reproducible so we can find out what's going on. And after 6,000 papers, we still haven't got that effect at the uh, sub-international limit level. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about hypersensitivity. I know this is a sensitive subject to a lot of people, and, uh, and so when I was at WHO, we had a special workshop on that. But what we can conclude from the wireless technologies and base stations is that there are no adverse short or long-term health effects from these signals. And the same conclusion has been reached by every major national and international review of the science. There's not one international review by a national authority or a competent international authority that has reached any different conclusion. And this just gives you a list of some of those reports, and they're in just about every, every uh, major country of the world. In the UK, there's been a number of reviews, <coughs> and I'm sure many of you saw the results of this mobile telecommunications health research program, which has just come out and was briefed in the press, and they couldn't find anything. And I was on this committee, and we identified research to fill these gaps it was one of the best run national research programs on EMF that I've ever been involved with and I've been involved with most of them. This was a very competent panel to make sure that we could get the right dosimetry and the right um, studies to be done to answer the questions. I should add that the Stewart Report recommended in 2000 that the UK adopt the international standards as a precautionary measure 
because the NRPB guideline was about five times higher. And so as a precautionary measure, they used the international guideline. Uh, this is just a bit on the uh, MTHR program. It was a government industry funded research initiative, 28 key projects. And you can see the list. There was no effect found. Uh, th there is a couple of issues that are still outstanding. One is um, some of the epidemiological studies are showing that while there doesn't seem to be any effect on cancers with use of mobile phones for people who have used it for less than 10 years, we still don't have enough data to be uh, absolutely sure about more than 10 years. So we, we do need to have more research in that area. The problem is that there's very few people have been using mobile phones for more than 10 years because of such a recent technology. So you don't get the numbers and so you don't get studies that are powerful enough to be able to um, get good uh, significant data. The other thing is that children have been using these technologies for a, a longer time. And as you know, children can be more sensitive to various environmental agencies than our adults. And so, well, we had a workshop on uh, children's exposure. Sorry, I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll, I'll mention more about this. We, we feel that we do need more studies that relate to children's exposure. Now, um, the NRPB became part of the Health Protection Agency in April 2005, and there's something which seems to me to be strange on the website. On the basis of studies so far conducted in-house, the agency sees no reason why Wi-Fi should not continue to be used in schools. And then it says, however, with any new technology, it's sensible precautionary approach as happened with mobile phones to keep the situation under ongoing review so that parents and others ha uh, can have as much reassurance as possible. That is why our chairman, Sir William Stewart, has stated it will be timely to carry out further studies uh, as this new technology is rolled out and the Health Protection Agency is discussing this with relevant parties. My question is, you're talking about very weak signals that are weak compared to radio, television, mobile phones, all of which uh, expose adults and children to much higher levels and uh, base stations, of course, are continuous exposure, as can be Wi-Fi. Uh, why are we looking at Wi-Fi when the, the levels are so much lower? We should be targeting those areas that expose people to the highest levels. That's just good public health. And the NRPB is, uh, oh, sorry, the HPA is apparently announcing that they will be doing a, a, a study on Wi-Fi. People say, let's be precautionary. Yes, I totally agree, let's be precautionary. It's good public hygiene to keep levels down to those that are really necessary to make the technology work properly. But if people willy-nilly implement precautionary measures, um, you have to be careful about this. There's been some studies, and this is one of them, that indicates that you may get much more concern by implementing precautionary measures in a way that's not satisfactory to everyone. And if I just have a look at the abstract, precautionary measures may actually trigger concerns and amplify EMF-related perceptions. Implementation of precautionary measures has no positive effect on trust in public health protection. And finally, risk managers who intend to implement precautionary measures merely as a means for reassuring the public will probably fail. And I think there's a number of situations where that has occurred. So what is the way forward? Uh, we have coordinated programs. We haven't got any established effects. Uh, people who are worried about exposures can use hands-free kits with the mobile. Pregnant women are not at risk because the high frequencies means that the penetration into the tissue is, is so low that the fetus doesn't get any significant absorption if people are worried about pregnant women. 
and children are certainly high users and increasing and more research is recommended in that area. I should add that with the WHO workshop uh, in Istanbul a couple of years ago, we concluded that the advocacy factor for the public in the ICNIRT uh, guidelines seems adequate to protect children, but because few studies have been uh, conducted, uh, more research is recommended, and WHO has re identified a research agenda of uh, where uh, the international scientific community is informed on what research is needed now to make better health risk assessments. The hypersensitivity issue is one that has um, received a lot of, uh, I guess, activist attention because many people suffer from symptoms like headaches, fatigue, stress, sleep disturbance, uh, which is not consistent. It, uh, each individual has a different set of symptoms so that you don't have a syndrome as such. And there has been a number of recent reviews, uh, including the UK study, which was one of the MTHR pr uh, funded studies by Elaine Fox at Essex University, and she found there was no connection between exposure to EMF and the symptoms that people were getting. Because you can put people into a uh, laboratory, put a black belt uh, partition, sit them on one side, have an exposure source on the other, and ask them, when is the source on or off? And they could only guess, which meant that the system, when, when they thought the system was on, their symptoms would appear. If they, if they thought it was off, they wouldn't. And so, by guessing, they really didn't know that the EMF was the uh, cause of, uh, there was no relationship between the EMF exposure and the symptoms that were produced. And that's been concluded in virtually all studies. And WHO came out with a fact sheet in December 2005 saying just that. So we don't have evidence, but we should continue research. We want to conduct risk assessments using well-accepted methods and transparent processes and disseminate the program uh, of or other results in the programs. And as I said, WHO has been uh, influential in developing over $250 million worth of research, predominantly in the RF area. One problem that is still outstanding is that using a mobile phone while driving will cause the accident rate of that person to go up three to four times. Thanks very much.